So it was great. It was great. It was one of those amazing afternoons, uh, like uh, uh, early evening when the sun is setting, it's hanging low, and it's painting everything gold, you know. And it's me and my grandfather and my father, and we stand, we're standing underneath the vineyard, and, and all the grapes are golden, you know, golden grapes, and we're picking them. The three generations. And then my grandmother is standing at the doorstep, and she's proudly observing the three generations, you know, picking the grapes. And my father and my grandfather, they're busy with local officials. So they're gossiping, basically. They're, 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 they start with a guy for, at the top of the village who bought a goat last week. And then they go to the next one who built a house. And then they go to the other one whose horse died. And then they go to the other one who married his daughter to the guy whose horse died. So everyone is interconnected. Everyone's just a huge network, you know? Not so huge, actually, but yeah. So when I fled with my parents at the age of three to come to Amsterdam, we didn't have any relatives here. It was just me, my mom, and my dad, and later my brother who was born here. Um, so this life that we had, this culture that we left behind, it was brought alive through the stories that my father would tell me. And um, first of all, it, it, it gave me these sort of out of control role models. And it allowed me to dream out of the box. Um, second of all, it showed me how important the, the, the power of storytelling is, especially to connect with um, parts of yourself that you don't have access to. Uh, I didn't have access to my grandparents. I did have access to my grandparents in the stories. Now, this combination of um, having these amazing stories um, and knowing, feeling the power of, of storytelling made for me wanting to do something with this art form. For 10 years, and also moving to a few different locations, it was just me and the family. I would say that the biggest difference in the development of the Mezrab is that when three years ago we moved into the um, big location, in the location that we have now, um, Mezrab became institutionalized. For the first time there was a, I, I, I now work with a partner, um, there is a team of people who run the space, uh, there's volunteers, there's 20, 30 volunteers that help out. Uh, so it's, it grew out of just being a very simple family thing to, um, I would say one of the cultural pil pillars of Amsterdam. It grew very organically into it, but it, it is a fundamental change from, from what it was. And it wasn't easy, um, especially because I never had money or a plan. A good host acts like it's their living room. So for me, an actor will come on stage and the audience is already there. But as a storyteller and especially as a host, you're there when the audience, before the audience comes in. You welcome them, you get to know them. It's your place, your, this is your space and you're welcoming them in. And in that sense, of course, you set the tone. Have a seat. You're welcome to move up. Um, my name is Rod. In case you have not been here in the last two hours and are like, what is this place? We are at the Mezrab, and our storytelling night is is based around true stories, and the theme for the night is... Miracles! Miracles, exactly. And uh, this is the extended living room of your own house, so welcome again. I'm going to offer you one more opportunity right now to talk to a stranger around you, someone you haven't spoken to yet. Maybe in that first act you were like about to, but then you got a little shy, so now you have to. Uh, your topic of conversation is miracles. I think it starts from this realization that people want to connect. People are actually, everybody desires connection when they leave the house. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the places that people go to uh, don't really offer that. There's, a, there's a, an articulated, sometimes unarticulated need to, to have a connection. But, some, but it's really difficult, I think, in the Netherlands. In the culture here, people don't typically just start talking to another table at a bar or at other, with other people at a, at a movie theater. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to give them the opportunity to. I actually turn around and they are from the same city I am in Malaga. And I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, like, that's amazing. Right behind you, it's happening right now. Miracle! Uh, A miracle is something you can work for. Nice. It's not a passive thing, it's an active thing. You get that miracle. I love that. <laughs> From the bottom up. Uh, what else? What other headlines? Yeah. My dad apologized. 
My dad apologized. <laughs> Never happened. So there's a little bit of an algorithm uh, that I guess sort of unofficially developed over the years after watching so many storytellers and so many people who I've asked to come up and tell the story. Uh, I think that there's a few things that work quite well. Uh, one is, again, being vulnerable, being willing to be vulnerable. Um, language is not an issue, so that's not, that doesn't come into play as a, as a, in the algorithm. You could be a, a terrible English speaker and still have a beautiful story to tell if you're being vulnerable. Uh, another one has to deal with the fact that the story needs to be over. It needs to be uh, emotionally done for the storyteller. Be ambitious, own it, but there has to be something else. And that has to do with your ambition of connecting to the audience. What is the reason you're connecting to the audience? And why are you telling what you're telling to the audience? And I think if a storyteller finds this inside of himself or herself, um, the stories will find a certain shine and a certain urgency, and they will become very powerful. So that I would say makes a good story to, to really know, but really do that journey inside of yourself and find out why is it that you're telling this particular story. We were happy. We were truly uh, a great couple. The one thing we weren't too happy about was not being able to fight. We sucked at fighting. So that just wouldn't happen. They would be polite conversations about how maybe, possibly, <laughs> eventually, things could be different. Uh, the one thing I started noticing, though, is that maybe, possibly, eventually, <laughs> I should start changing. I should do things differently. I was off. But it's, it's, if you're bringing it to the audience, you're giving them what they need. So if they need to laugh, you'll make it funny. If they need to be chill because it's, they're exhausted and it's 35 degrees and it's a summer night, then you might tell it in a more chill manner. So the way you tell the story depends on what the audience needs. If you come with a need, then you're going to tell it in the way you need it. Um, and there's nothing I find that you know, like there are people that like it. There's always people that like it. But in general, the majority of an audience if they feel that an emotion is not processed, they will pull back. The biggest gift for me is the realizing that we define our own narrative and that our whole lives are stories. And I can sit down and I can tell you a story about my mother in which she was an incredible academic who brought me fantastic uh, ideas and thoughts in an international world that I was connected to and traveled everywhere. Uh, which is a true story. I can tell you a story about this wonderful, playful woman who had creativity and would do crazy adventures and, and just never was paying attention to things like matching socks or clothes or going to school on time, which was also a true story. And I can tell you a story of a mother who was insanely neglectful and didn't always have food ready and seriously damaged her children emotionally. And all these are completely true stories. Which story I choose to tell is my choice. Okay, give me your hand. And I gave her my hand. And she spits on it. <laughs> At seven years old, you don't want to be spit by your grandmother. <laughs> so I looked to my grandmother, what is happening here? And then she started praying. Mother Maria, she was praying for Mother Maria in, in Dutch. And, and, and I spit again, and I spit again. And, and, again, and, and I thought, uh. so I went away and started to play with my other cousins and nieces. And, and we had a really great time. And, I totally forgot it. I totally forgot it. Three or four days later, I looked to my hand and they were gone. <laughs> they were really gone. And I went to my mother and said, they are gone. <laughs> and my mother said, with whom did you talk? With grandmother. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then that Sunday, I came to my grandmother's house and I looked to my grandmother and she showed her hand, and they were there. <laughs> oh my God. My grandmother was a witch. <laughs> I was so proud to have a witch in the family. <laughs> oh 
Oh my god, no, I didn't know anybody who had a witch in the family. So when I uh, when I started getting involved with the with the art of my culture, uh, I started playing Iranian instruments. And uh, you play them with a with a pick, uh, which in my language is called mezrab. Uh, so mezrab is basically Persian and Turkish. It's a word that comes from Arabic, um, which just means guitar pick. Um, however, I like the sound of it, and uh, I'm I'm a cheeky guy. I like to do things differently. And most Iranians, when they pick a name for a place, they they go for these horrible cliches, like they call it the garden of the heavenly flowers or the. I don't know, the Blossom and the Nightingale, and I hate these names, so I, I thought I'll take something that kind of sounds insignificant, which is what it does to Persian ears, and yet you need that little insignificant thing to make big waves into the world. And that's what the first Mesmer was, it was this tiny place, you know what I'm and it sent big waves into the world, um, and that's how the name was born. <laughs> so it's just a big thing in Persian. Oh, my God. 